This lecture will provide an overview of the major questions relating to stories that stem from or span from the book of Exodus all the way through to uh, the books of Joshua and Judges. And so, although you may have only had snippets of these in your reading, you'll hopefully have at least begun to get a sense that uh, this story is connected, and in fact, it's connected you know, within the biblical tradition, uh, although there may have been separate works, the Pentateuch and then what follows, there have been suggestions that in fact the publication of those writings that stem from, you know, or that span the story that goes from Genesis all the way through to Joshua and Kings may in fact, you know, in their present form, have been published as a unity. At the very least, there's a continuation of the story, and so an intentional weaving together of the stories and a connecting of them by the author or authors of these works. And the question of how the Israelites came to be in the land previously known as Canaan, whether there was any kind of historical experience that relates to the narratives about an exodus from Egypt, those cannot be separated, not least because the question of date affects all of them. So if we start with the question of the historicity of the exodus, right, there are a number of issues. Sometimes there are issues which you know, are relevant even from a theological perspective. Right? Many will point out the question of divine consistency, and if one doesn't see events of the sort that one reads about in the book of Exodus happening in one's own time, what's the appropriate course of action? Is it to s suspend disbelief and read the story on its own terms? Is it to assume that there must be legend present and uh, later elaboration? What's the appropriate response to this? Some assume that the appropriate response is to say, well, if it's in this text, then it must have happened as described. But that's not the only way that uh, people, including religious believers, right, those approaching the text as scripture, approach it. From a historian's perspective, of course, one is not going to say that it's likely that things happen in the past that one doesn't see in the present day. And so this is not unrelated to principles that we've already discussed related to how historians approach texts. There are also internal issues, right? and there is an article by Lester Grabby that asks the question, what would we expect the history of later Israel to look like if the Exodus happened as described? And that includes the very, very large numbers, right, which would have necessitated a very, very long crossing of any body of water, whether a sea of reeds, and of course the Hebrew text refers to a sea of reeds, and reeds grow in fresh water, and so it's fairly clear that this is not referring to the Red Sea, but it is referring to a body of water, whatever that body of water was, and it would have taken a significant amount of time for millions of people to cross over any body of water. There's reference to a strong wind having been prepared by God, and if this is some sort of um, freshwater inlet, or some other kind of smaller body of water, that might make sense. Understood as the Red Sea, or some other similar, similarly large body of water, that really doesn't make sense. Right? A strong wind doesn't cause waters to part in the way that's depicted in the, the movie version of uh, the story. And so even within the text itself, right, there are these issues. And so we've talked already about the fact that historical study and historical evidence sometimes excludes some particular explanation of the data as not compatible with the evidence. And an approach that tries to argue for what we might call inerrancy is going to face problems. There's no one period of time during which all the relevant cities were destroyed. We have letters and all kinds of records of various sorts from ancient Egypt and it's simply impossible to imagine that cattle were killed, all cattle perhaps, right, by plagues and things like that. Water turned to blood throughout a whole land, and no one 
made mention of this in any kind of letter writing or inscription or anything of that sort. And so, while absence of evidence, it's often said, is not evidence of absence, we cannot posit that major events occurred in the history of a people, right, like Egypt, one that, one for which we have substantial records and documentation. We can't posit that a very substantial event occurred if there doesn't seem to be a time period in which anything like that was recorded, or we have such a large gap in our documentary evidence that we could fill in the gap with something of the sort. Right? Once one sets aside that stance that's referred to as claiming scriptural inerrancy, which of course is not one that tends to fare well when historical investigation takes place, but that doesn't exclude the possibility that there's some information in these sources that historians can make use of. And we do have evidence of a significant influx of people into areas that were largely uninhabited in the land known as Canaan during the relevant period, and so that might be part of the picture. We have the Renepta Stele, which indicates the existence of a people group, not yet a nation, called Israel in Canaan in the 13th century. And so that seems to tie in with perhaps the information we get in the Book of Judges, for instance. And historians like John Bright have often commented that it seems unlikely that this nation would have invented for themselves a completely false history in which they were once the slaves of the Egyptians. Why invent that? Right? And so that some sort of slavery to the Egyptians or something that could be described in those terms was part of their history seems like something less likely to be fabricated. And so historians are not at all opposed to the possibility that there might be some historical reminiscence of this. We have evidence for Semites in Egypt, right? People of the same people group as the Israelites. We don't have anything that clearly refers to the Israelites. But one group that's well documented and that has often been connected with the Israelites are a group known as the Hyksos. This is a Semitic people, right? so people related to the Israelites and Canaanites, and of course the Israelites and Canaanites are themselves related in terms of their language and um, you know, biology and other things. This refers to a much earlier period, right? but one of their kings had as part of a compound name, the name Jacob. Right? So their names are similar to those of Israelites. They worshipped Baal and other Semitic deities which the Israelites, rightly or wrongly, also worshipped at various points. And they were driven out of Canaan, or sorry, driven out of Egypt to Canaan, which had been part of Egypt's uh, territorial holdings in this period. And the Egyptians pursued them, and there were many cities that were destroyed. And later Jewish and Egyptian historians related this group to the Israelites. And so the possibility that some reminiscence of a flight from, or perhaps an expulsion from Egypt by distant ancestors was part of the ancestral memory that contributed to the formulation of the Exodus story. And we could imagine fleeing, you know, large numbers of destruction, being rewritten by later storytellers into a, something that was more positive for uh, the Israelites and their ancestors. If one looks at maps of the Sinai Peninsula that are intended to map the, or trace the movements of the Israelites, what you'll see is that there'll very often be large numbers of sites with Mount Sinai question mark, or something of that sort. There are lots of questions that we simply can't answer in terms of exactly what route are they supposed to have taken when they fled, what, when exactly did this occur. Right? Attempts to relate this to specific details in the biblical account often faces difficulties. There's reference to building of Ramses in Egypt, you know, and Israelites being involved in that. That does not match up with the dates for the Hyksos, for instance. And so, whether the later Exodus traditions, in fact, meld together several events of a different sort, right, and combine them into one narrative, that's also a possibility. It's crucial to keep in mind how much we simply don't know. Another important 
bit of historical evidence that's often related to the emergence of the Israelites are the Amarna letters. These are letters from the rulers of city-states in Canaan, which were addressed to the pharaoh uh, in Egypt. Because we have these you know, from one side, you know, the recipient side, we don't know whether there were responses and if so, what they were. The numbers of troops asked for by the um, Canaanite kings indicate something about the population there, the nature of the problem, the extent of the problem, things like that. One of the most intriguing de details in these letters are the references to Habiru, right, which some have suggested might have some kind of relationship to the term Hebrew. But this is clearly a social class, right? It's not simply the ancestors of the Israelites and nothing more and nothing less. We find references to the Habiru or Abiru. It's, it's spelled in some different ways. And they're found across a wide array of geographical regions. And so it's clear that this is referring not to one particular people group's ancestors, but a social class that was fairly widespread. And the members of the social class were rebelling in Canaan during this period. And so that's intriguing as well. Could that be part of the story? Here's one example, and I won't read it, but it's actually from King of Jerusalem, right, writing, appealing for help, because not only are the Apiru rebelling, but they have people sympathizing with them and helping them from within the land, right, who are regarded as traitors. The Merneptah Stila right, refers to that particular pharaoh's uh, conquests and battles, including in Canaan, and it makes reference to Israel. Right? And here you have the actual inscription as well as the reversed hieroglyphics to be read in the order that English speakers are used to. And it refers to Israel and uses a marker which indicates that they're not yet a state, right? And so that allows one to try to correlate this with some of the data. And so any connection with Egypt in the sense of residing in Egypt would have to be prior to this date. If we ask where did the Israelites come from, right, there have been a lot of interesting suggestions from historians. And one of the things that needs to be noted is that if the Israelites, as their language and other features might suggest, if their origins are to be found within the land of Canaan, they could still have been slaves of the Egyptians because the land of Canaan was part of the Egyptians' empire during a significant part of its history. And evidence from some of the earliest settlements, if we can call them that, that can be identified as Israelite, right? people who don't eat pork in the highlands, have a high degree of cultural continuity with the Canaanites, right? which suggests that they have a connection. If we ask, did Jericho's walls fall down? Could battles have been part of the story? Certainly there are some battle, right, um, places like Hatzor, where desecration of images, right, beheading of idols, things like that, might suggest that there's some historical reminiscence there. But even though the walls of Jericho did fall, it's not in the same time period, right, the evidence for a collapsed wall that was confidently, at one point, said to be the wall that came tumbling down in Joshua's time. It's not the same time period as the evidence from Hatzor. And so trying to fit the evidence together into something that happens in one generation simply will not work. But it could be that we're dealing with a longer process or a more complex process. If we ask about the evidence of pottery right, across the time periods we're talking about, the early Israelite pottery has been said to be simpler in character, but there's continuity in style, right? And so there's reason to think that there's cultural continuity between Israel and Canaan, Israelite and Canaanite, suggesting that the origins of at least the vast majority of later Israel is not to be found outside the land. This image shows that the Egyptians, in fact, held 
the territory known as Canaan, right, at the high point of their uh, power. And of course, Egyptian control of the land was something that continued to be an issue for Israelites even in later times, during the time of the monarchy. Right? So here, for instance, you have a map showing the extent of Egypt's control. And of course, there's, you know, there are moments when Egyptian power was on the wane, when a new people group could have emerged or could have taken control right, in a land where they were previously present. And in the documentaries you'll have watched for uh, the class, you'll have seen some of the evidence about that discussed in more detail. I find it useful in drawing to the drawing to a conclusion to think about national stories in an American context. Lots of people have the experience of maybe being in a school play as in elementary school, but at the very least having heard one in which there was talk of our forefathers having landed on Plymouth Rock. And yet that is not literally true of the ancestors of most people in America who actually say those words, or certainly a lot of them didn't come on that particular boat, right, most of us, didn't even come in that time period, right, came much later. And so what's being talked about is a grafting of other peoples and their experience into the story of one particular people, right, and a culturally significant moment. And so it may be that some group escaped from slavery in Egypt, and that that moment was not the literal history of most of the ancestors of later Israel, but that that moment was decisive in the formation of the nation and their sense of identity. The stories of Israel and the imagery of the Israelite experience becomes a major component in the struggle for civil rights in the United States. And Martin Luther King Jr.'s famous speech about going to the mountaintop and seeing the promised land echoes the story of Moses right, going up to the mountaintop and seeing the promised land. And so if we think about what people have expected in trying to bring about social change, finding inspiration in these stories, for the most part they haven't expected that seas will literally part, plagues from heaven will come about to bring an end to tyranny. And so it's worth reflecting on whether it's necessary to find those stories to be liter literally factual in their details in order for them to be religiously meaningful. If one looks about online, of course, one will find a lot of claims that suggest that, in fact, not only is the evidence for the exodus and conquest uh, clear-cut, but it's abundant. And there have been a lot of charlatans and uh, people who clearly are not archaeologists, who've posted photos claiming that they are of things like an Egyptian chariot wheel that they supposedly saw in the Red Sea. And these things are never documented, right? You never get an actual study by archaeologists. Even if this wheel is not planted there and just a pure hoax, it's not clear that this shiny object is ancient, right? And so you should be very wary when you're confronted with claims about evidence related to these matters online. It's crucial to look and ask what do historians, professional historians who are asking about all the relevant evidence, what do they conclude and why do they conclude it? In concluding this lecture, let me talk about the three main theories that you'll encounter among scholars and historians. If we ask how did Israel get into Canaan, one traditional answer that focuses mainly on the book of Joshua and some of the archaeological evidence for destruction of cities suggests it was through invasion and conquest. A second theory is that peaceful infiltration was a major feature. And in addition to some other archaeological evidence, there's also the story in the stories in Genesis about patriarchs settling in Canaan and living there peacefully. Right? And Indeed, in the book of Judges as well, if one didn't have the book of Joshua prefacing it, you'd understand that this was a people group that lived in Canaan and which then slowly comes to power, struggling with other peoples living there. 
A third possibility is social uprising or revolution, much as is the case in uh, historical details we have about the Apiru. A social class or groups of people within the land rising up against their overlords, both Egyptian and local. And it may be that a combination of these could be the case. Right? So it may be that the story of Israel, in fact, includes more than one of these factors. If the evidence was decisive in favor of one of these, then there probably would be significantly more agreement among historians than there is. At, for this particular juncture in the history of the people of Israel, the evidence is somewhat piecemeal and fragmentary and less than decisive. And so, on the one hand, it's not the case that any and all possible theories are equally valid. But on the other hand, there is certainly room for disagreement even among the experts. And so, as you look further into this, if you're interested in looking in detail at some of the archaeological evidence, keep in mind that, on the one hand, the evidence is not compatible with all possible scenarios, but the evidence being fragmentary may be compatible with more than one option. And that's one of the reasons why historians and scholars sometimes reach diverse conclusions about what actually happened in the case of the emergence of Israel in the land of Canaan.